chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And now reading in the second chapter of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? 
Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Now this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. And the sun shall return to darkness, and the moon to blood, for the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the Lord, name of the Lord shall be saved. Finally, reading from 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the, the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who lots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. I have something else I want to read for you. <clears throat> now this is definitely not scripture. It's something I wrote for the Harrow News, and it will appear this, this coming week. It's my pastoral message, but I've called it the first epistle to the Horobians. Now, early Christian missionaries wrote to faith communities they'd helped to establish. Some letters are preserved in the, in the New Testament. So imagine with me if one of those early Jesus followers and leaders wrote to us in our current situation. To the people of Harrow and surrounding communities and all others created, loved, and blessed by God, grace and peace to you. It seems such a long time since we've been We've seen each other face to face. I give thanks to the multitude of ways you are blessed and in turn offer numerous blessings to others, especially those in need. We face many challenges. Much we take for granted has been disrupted. Your sadness over your losses is real. but Do not allow your grief, your frustration to justify the abandoning of efforts to keep the most vulnerable amongst us safe. As Paul, our brother in faith, once wrote, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. I appeal to you to live out of a spirit of hope and generosity, even in these trying times. Resist the temptation to follow the counsel of the loudest, the most extreme, those who care ultimately only for themselves. Resist also the temptation to grasp onto quick and simple solutions to complex problems. Avoid the trap of the blame game. Place your real faith, your confidence in God, the creator of the universe, as revealed to us in love. Let Jesus-like love, that places the well-being of others before our own, guide us and inspire us. This love is its own reward and is most pleasing to God. I continue to pray for those who have suffered the loss of loved ones and were denied by current circumstances. 
consolation of the community gathered around them for a funeral. Our hearts are with them. Pray also for your elected officials and those appointed to serve the common good. We may not all be called to serve in positions of power and authority, but each of us each day can be kind. We can be unselfish. Let us not squander those opportunities, but instead actively seek ways to be of help, to show support to those who place themselves at risk on our behalf. Some of you have asked, how do we continue in the life of faith when we no longer gather on the Lord's Day? Are we not instructed to worship and pray together? Are we not to be devoted to the breaking of bread and sharing the cup? The way of faith revealed to us in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is often difficult, but only becomes impossible when we attempt it without God. God is always prepared to help us. God is always with us, even and especially in these times when we cannot be with each other. The people of the way, followers of Jesus, grew as a movement long before we had the resources to build meeting places, which became our places of worship. In the earliest days, the homes of believers were the places in which faith was shared, taught, and lived. You are not alone in your struggles, your questions, your anxieties for the present and for the future. We are all joined, united by God's Spirit, who prays with and for us, often in sighs too deep for words, and with the wisdom of the one who truly knows us, for they were present as all things were being created. Do not abandon the ways of God, for God has surely not abandoned us. We share in the promise of God's love, which is deeper, wider, higher, more encompassing than any of the things which frighten or threaten us. There is more to us than our fear. There is more to our existence than the present situation. You are God's beloved. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. So, um, hi, Robin. Hi, Daryl. Well, welcome to Harrow United Church. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, we're we're uh, doing something a little different every once in a while during the season of Pentecost. I thought I'd talk to some of the most spirited people I know. Oh, ones boy. In who, ones in whom God's spirit is absolutely alive. And uh, partly because it's my... my uh, my privilege to talk to you all and, and see how everyone's doing but also i think the folks at harrow deserve to hear other voices than mine because they've been looking at me and seeing me a lot uh, yeah. in, in, these, in these little boxes on the screen so um this everyone this is this is robin sherman she's the the ordained minister at tecumseh united church and uh Lexi and I have known her and her partner, Diane, for a very long time. Um, they were amongst the first people to meet our newborn daughter, Naomi. So that tells you how long ago that was, because <laughs> Naomi's 21 now. And yep. the amazing thing is that, that Robin hasn't aged. Um, <laughs> she looks exactly, exactly the same. Um, I will send you a, a check. <laughs> um, so... so I'm kind of asking all, all, the, all the friends that I do this with sort of the same set of questions. Who am I? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm born and raised in Kingsville. So uh, I am a, an Essex County girl at heart. Uh, lots of family out there in the county and uh, um, certainly in the Harrow area. Some of you will know me from my, uh, my heritage in the Bailey clan and uh, the Malots and the Waggles and all of those folks and the names that you hear out and about that area. So uh, I came into ministry uh, later in life. I was in my 40s, believe it or not, when I went into ministry and uh, basically had had a career. Um, uh, I did, I've done a lot of different jobs in my life, but the one just prior to uh, ministry, was that I worked for the AIDS Committee of Windsor. And I had worked there um, in some capacity because I had various jobs there through my time there, but I was there probably for about nine years. And so um, I worked there early on in the, fairly early on in the uh, HIV AIDS 
crisis and uh, learned a lot in that job that I feel had uh, a lot of uh, it's the idea of the passion and where my passion lies or lays is um, in the social justice area. And so uh, it was a, a great stepping stone because throughout uh, that time with the AIDS committee, we introduced um, services to injection drug users. We worked with people on the streets, the, the uh, sex trade workers, and, um, and my job was education. And so I was very involved with uh, educating parts of our community, the Essex County community, around HIV and AIDS. And one of the, even, even though I had a personal interest in that and passion in that because my brother had passed away from HIV AIDS uh, complications in 1988, um, and, and was one of the first uh, in our area to uh, be tested and, and die from it. Um, uh, because, the, I, I learned I was in a time when we you had you had to well you didn't have to but what I learned in that time was uh, I lost a lot of judgments that I had about people and started recognizing that people are people are people and regardless of where we've come from what we do in our lives and, and, and where we may be heading we all started from the same place and that was as people who just wanted to be part of something and loved by someone mm -hmm. and that became really really uh intensified for me in that time that i was there uh recognizing that you know, the people that were living on the streets, the people who were using injection drugs, which might not be the people you think. They weren't always the same. Uh, lots of injection drug users were steroid use and, and the bodybuilding. So you had these really buff guys coming in that anybody would have looked at and said, well, they're healthy and great. Uh, but th th those were the areas that are, were using injection drugs. And, um, and so it wasn't just the people on the streets, but of course, there certainly was that element as well. And of course that leads you into sex trade workers, which are both uh, um, engaging in, in unsafe sexual practices um, and also the drug trade. Mm -hmm. So it was about losing judge, it was about ta looking at myself very closely and recognizing what is it that all these people have in common? Well, the common denominator is nobody grew up thinking I'm going to be an injection drug user or I'm going to be in this x trade. Boy, this is a great profession. People's lives led them into these things for a variety of reasons. And so that started me really looking at, uh, looking at people in a very different view. And throughout that time, uh, having a, uh the call that i experienced is that going to be a different question uh, I think, no i think you're doing great okay <laughs> the, the call that started was and and uh you know some of the story very well of course i was attending westminster united church and your dear wife was the uh, minister there and i used to go to lexi uh, just for conversation a, a place to kind of let some of this go um and and she was very helpful for me in a lot of ways in in looking at um listening to me about my job and and uh, the things that i was experiencing there and talking to me about my own passion and faith with all of that and so uh she would she would say to me are you here on an official visit meaning did I want it recorded that I was now discerning ministry? And I kept saying no. But something kept calling me there. And something kept nagging at me, which I recognize now was a call. And I think, I think 14 years into this now, because I was ordained in 2006, this, this week, uh, as we were all ordained in May, usually. Yep. Um, May 28th uh, was my ordination, and um, 
there were lots of things along the way that could have and maybe for someone else would have stopped them from continuing the path into ministry. Um, but for some reason, I could not let it go that I needed to be in this work. And, and I think that that is definitely the difference between applying for a job and answering a call is that you may not even know why you're continuing to do it because there's lots of reasons not to. Um, but you just keep doing it because something is saying, this is what you need to do and this is where you need to be. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of, about how I, how I got into this mess. <laughs> Well, actually, actually, I, I, I have heard some of that before, Robin, but some of it was also fairly new to me. I, I had not heard what, that very profound piece about um, you, you, your work experience leading you to just, just drop your sense of judging other people. Yeah. And, and very beautiful line that, that you said that people who are in these difficult circumstances that wasn't their dream when they were growing up that they would be an I you know an injection drug user or a sex trade worker to be able to, to think about them as as children growing up with their own hopes and dreams and remembering these are people that yep. that's that's powerful um yeah yeah that's uh, and, it, and it absolutely was a powerful powerful experience i can remember sitting on the floor with a young woman who was high as high can be on drugs and he had brought a bag of baby clothes that she had found in an alley a garbage bag and she brought them to us saying I knew if I brought them here you'd get them to someone who would use them but in that uh, she had dumped them all over the floor and the the uh, uh, workers all were busy with other people so one of the workers came to me and said can you sit with her and just just talk to her, help her fold up these because we told her to put the clothes back in the bag kind of thing. So I, I sat with her in the hallway of our office building. And, and as we were folding clothes, she was asking me questions like, um, did I think these clothes were going to go to someone that would use them? Yes, of course. Um, did I know what happened to her children? She had had three children taken from her as they were born each one as they were born because she was addicted to drugs and those babies were born addicted to drugs i mean there's no getting around what had happened to them but her question to me was did i know where her children were did i have any idea um what had happened to them what would happen to them where did they go mm. and honestly daryl i i sat there and i could feel the tears coming and I just started to pray. And I just said, God, either, either help this woman or take her. Because those were the two choices. She, she was really at, you know, in any case, um, powerful stories like that that were, that were touching me far beyond a worker this is a job kind of thing. And that, that's really where the, the idea of it being a call, I wouldn't have called it that then. I can look back now and see that even my initial reaction is to pray was the, was the message from God. You need to be in this in a different way, in a deeper way. I, I don't and, know if you, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I don't know if you're, uh, preaching on Pentecost this weekend. Um, but I've been, I've been reflecting on, on the Acts 2 story about the, you know, that weird story where the tongues of heat or fire or flame come down and, and all of a sudden this whole crowd of people is able to understand each other. Yeah. Um, you know, one person's speaking, uh, but all these people from all these different places and worlds and ways of life are all able to comprehend what 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 the guy is saying exactly I, I make a connection between that and uh, the 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 scales of judgment that that whole thing dropping away from you and you being able to look at a person who's just hurting and yes. had a life and had dreams and all of a sudden um, you don't understand her story 
but yeah. you're trying to speak in the same language and and uh exactly. or, or, or where the language fails you realize you got to pray yep well, underneath, yep. all, underneath all of it the spirits at work messing with you um yeah um making it po- <laughs> really you know and making it possible for you yeah. to sit with this woman in her mess um yep. and and be be the be the loving compassionate presence um in the midst of chaos where yep. all, all the other workers are busy and and the mess on the floor needs to be cleaned up and what's going to happen to this woman and uh it would seem like the craziest thing in the world that, that what you're going to do is sit there and pray. Yeah. But, yeah. In a social service agency where we were technically not allowed to pray. So, I mean, it was within, it was a prayer within myself. I certainly didn't stop and say, Hey, let's pray together. Uh, you know, it was that kind of a moment, but it, that it doesn't need to be that kind of a moment for anybody. If you find yourself in that situation, it's you that offers the, the prayer, right? It's, it's, it's with, it's coming from you and it, God knows who it's for. <laughs> you don't have to let that person know it's for them. It's your, it's your own offer. Um, and it's, it's your own, uh, it's for you too. Yep. I mean, I didn't know what else to do. It was like, it was truly, a. I had no words for this woman. No well, words. That's that, uh, thing in the New Testament about the spirit prays sometimes with sighs too deep for words. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, there's, I, I'm going way off the set of questions in script, but there's a, there's a, a way of praying that I, I in, 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 my, in my other work as a spiritual director, I used to teach. Um, it's based on uh, Tibetan Buddhist practice. M- maybe you know about this called Tonglen or Tonglen. I don't think I do know this one. Um, well, I, I, I've been sharing it a little bit with some folks from Harrow, and I think it's, um, it kind of sounds like what you were already doing. Um, but, but the formal process is, is uh, it's about breath. And you're breathing in, mm-hmm. and you are accepting the the misery, the tragedy, the chaos, the unrest, the pain of the world or of the person that you're sitting with. You're just accepting it, yeah. and saying this this is part of life. But and I, I take this in, and maybe I can relieve this person of some of it. And then when you breathe yeah. out, you're breathing out peace. So you're taking, nice. taking in, taking on some of the pain of the world, and you're breathing out peace. And yeah. um, I think from a Christian perspective, um, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm doing that, I'm kind of um, following after the way of Jesus. Yeah. You know, sitting in those places that I don't want to be in. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Messy, yes. awful, messy, awful places and being faced with someone else's misery and and the horrors yeah. of that young woman's life and, and and but also wanting to be there and not knowing how to be there not yeah. really, not really having anything of, of of myself to offer except yeah. I'll, I'll sit with you i'll take it in and i i pray for peace for you yeah um i i i say that to people when they're sitting with with their with their loved ones when they're dying yes uh, and i Absolutely. do that when i'm sitting when i when i'm sitting with people and and uh I have no words for them. Yeah. I, I can't make the the crap that's falling down into their life go away. That's uh, right. But I can sit with them. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah. can I can uh I can let some of it fall on me too. Yeah. And I can pray for peace. Um yeah. and then I feel just a little bit less useless. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because you do. You whenever you're in these situations and, and and I think especially as ministers now, uh, you know, jumping ahead now, these whatever many years later this would be now, I, I, you know, I think about people look to us for an answer. And so often we have to say to them, I have no answer. I have nothing but prayer, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is what it comes down to. And then what my prayer is only that you find, my prayer can only be, that you that that person finds some peace with what is happening in their life mm-hmm. yeah. and you know that difference between healing and cure 
you know, uh, healing does not always mean cure. And that's the other lesson that I learned in HIV work. When there was no cure, healing was all that you had. Yep. And that only meant a spiritual healing. It didn't, it never meant a medical healing. And so I looked at all of the story, all through my, all through my school and now in ministry, I look at all of the, the uh, stories of Jesus's healing always is about restoring you to community, right? It's always about putting you back into a place where the community will, will support you or be with you. He's mm -hmm. never, these people died of something eventually as we all did. Nobody lived forever after. Even Lazarus died again. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, nobody lived in this in this earthly life again. And so, uh, you know, it's never about a cure that means we live on and on and on and on and on. It only means we're healed in this moment for these things that are happening. Yeah. And that was another re very clear reality in, in HIV work. That, uh, there's no cure, so the, the best you can hope for is some healing to, to, to manage life through the rest of your life here. Mm -hmm. And to see that others were okay, or, uh, you know, um, were able to face what was happening, be supportive in that way. Heavy. Heavy stuff we've gotten into, Daryl. Good stuff, though. I think I think I think uh, we're we're actually sounding in, in bits and bits and pieces, almost like a sermon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good, because that's what it's going to be. Here are my pastoral prayers for this Pentecost weekend. God of creation, God who sent His Jesus, God who accompanies us and guides us by the Spirit. In the season of Pentecost, we give thanks for the promise you've given through the millennia, through the prophets, through the communities of faith, and in the hearts of those who seek to follow Jesus, that you are always with us. Your spirit is wild and untamed and not bound by the walls of certain buildings or even by our sometimes small and limited imaginations. You are so much more and so much more available to us than we think. This is such a good thing, especially now when much of what we've come to expect from our church community simply isn't possible. We miss getting together in the same physical space. We miss each other's faces and voices and presence, not to deliver just on some little screen like this. We miss working together. We miss singing together, praying together, having conversation after a worship service. God, we worry about those who are even more isolated than usual because of the pandemic precautions we are observing. We pray for those who spend all or most of their days and nights within the same four walls, in rooms that can feel very small. We remember those who have suffered losses recently, especially those who were denied the possibility of all things we normally do to honor a life and mourn a death. We pray for those who are sick. There are those who require elective surgeries and other procedures who are now waiting to hear when those can be scheduled. There are those who need to see their dentist, their counselor, their therapist, or other specialist. We pray for those who rely upon 12-step programs and other support groups to help them in their struggles with addiction and codependency and other important issues. We pray for those who do, who do not feel safe in their homes. We pray for those who are feeling sad, lonely, dispirited. We pray that they will know that despite the physical separations we are now experiencing, we are not totally alone, that you, God, are with each of us. We pray for those who continue their efforts on the front lines, paramedics and firefighters and police officers, personal support workers and nurses and social workers, medical technicians and physicians, researchers and clinicians, administrators and security staff, maintenance workers whose jobs have never been so obviously essential. We pray for our civic leaders, elected and appointed officials at all levels of government. We pray that in these heightened times of anxiety and worry, that we will be all, at all times, guided by compassion and decency. We pray that in this time of crisis, we can remember to be our best selves and to expect the same from our decision makers and public servants. We pray with gratitude for the members of the Canadian Armed Forces who are being called upon in these times to do work that is literally changing and saving lives. 
We pray for the well-being and of all the residents and staff of long-term care facilities, homeless for the aged, and rehabilitation hospitals. We pray for those who are compelled by circumstances to return to work, even though they're not sure about their own safety. We pray also for those whose jobs are in question. We pray for business owners and managers who are trying to navigate things in this challenged economy. In this Pentecost season, which is in part a celebration of the miracle that people from different places and varied backgrounds can, with the Spirit's help, grow to understand each other, our prayers also include the sad lament that in recent days, stories have been appearing that remind us of the tragic evils of racism and assumed white privilege. We pray for the family and friends of George Floyd, the man killed this week in Minneapolis while being subdued by a police officer. We pray for all people of color who live with the consciousness that too often there seems to be a different set of rules and laws for some. We pray with thanks for the courage and grace of Christian Cooper, the young man who survived a very real threat in New York's Central Park and who lived to accept the apology of the woman who tried to convince the police that an African man was, African American man was prepared to harm her. We pray for a spirit of reconciliation and harmony and justice. We pray for the leaders of Herald United Church and the people we serve in Jesus' name. Help us to find our way into this new time. There are so many questions about how we continue our ministries and how to raise the funds we'll need to support them. We pray for the Reverend Robin Sherman and the leaders and members of Tecumseh United Church and the people they serve. Help her and other faith leaders to trust that the faithful work they do is sufficient and important. We pray for all the faith communities, service groups, and social agencies, and businesses, levels of government, and public service who are striving to be of help. We pray for the Harrow Food Bank and the Windsor Downtown Mission and the people they endeavor to assist. We make all of our prayers as followers of Jesus, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My hope and prayer is that you're all staying safe and doing well. And if you have anything that you need from us, from the church, don't be afraid to give us a call. I'd love to hear from you. Bye for now. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. We are not alone. We are never
not alone, God is with us.